to be with you here, to be with you today, because we share a mutual concern. We all realize that our nation is losing sight of the foundational principles that have sustained our constitutional republic and our freedoms. And today we're going to discuss one of those principles, and that is federalism. So I'm very grateful for the vision of the sponsors, and I'm very honored to be asked to participate today. We need to understand that federalism is not just a theoretical idea for political philosophers to discuss. It is about the very practical nuts and bolts of our Constitution that every American should understand. In order to protect personal liberty, our founders relied upon federalism as the organizing central principle of their constitutional design. They believed in the division of federal and state power in order to protect the individual liberty. Then after subdividing the powers into two distinct governments, federal and state, they further subdivided those powers in an attempt to prevent the accumulation of power into the hands of a few. They counted on federalism to be that fortress which would stand between us and the growth of centralized power, a power which they knew would threaten freedom. Yet today we're seeing a runaway federal bureaucracy that is indeed doing what they feared. Our national government has established all manner of bureaucracies to administer what were meant to be the sole functions of the states and local communities. Such things as education, health care, the environment, agriculture, social welfare programs, labor, even setting the minimum wage, are now being micromanaged through Washington, D.C. States must jump through hoops set by the federal government and petition Washington bureaucrats for permission to make all sorts of changes to these programs. We must beg for waivers to the no child is left behind and race to the top. If we seek to add accountability to social welfare programs, we must gain their approval. We cannot even protect the citizens of our states from unfair tax penalties if they desire to exercise their choice not to buy health insurance. <laughs> we must file lawsuits and petition the EPA to cease its power grab over our industry a cap and trade and to stop its constant erosion of property rights through water regulations. In South Georgia now we're seeing the Corps of Engineers enforce the regulation of wetlands to an absurd extent. We're seeing pine plantations, whereas my grandfather used to say the land was as dry as an ash cave, being counted as wetlands and preventing even further use and development of those properties. Yet the writers of the Federalist Papers totally dismissed the fears of the Anti-Federalists who warned that the national government would encroach upon state functions as we see today. Alexander Hamilton was incredulous at the idea, remarking that such mundane things as agriculture could never be desirable for national jurisdiction. And James Madison declared that the powers of the national government would be few and defined. So we have to ask, what has happened? Were our founders right to count on federalism? And if so, why is it working? And what can we do about it? How can we draw upon the wisdom of our founders or even their mistakes to ensure that federalism works as it was intended to work? These are just some of the questions which we will explore today. Since I've been asked to lay the groundwork for this forum, I plan to cover key elements from the political philosophy of our founders, beginning with their worldview. We'll review some of the Federalist Papers and touch briefly on the guiding philosophies of John Locke and Montesquieu. Then we'll consider how an eviscerated federalism undermines not only our republic, but our individual liberties and what we can do about that. Now, in the day of our founders, political philosophy was well developed. They drew from a great reservoir of what was then modern writing, bathed in the Enlightenment. They analyzed the political theories of philosophers such as Montesquieu, 
So, Thomas Hobbes, David Hume, and John Locke. They also drew upon the writings of antiquity, such as those of Plato and Aristotle. In addition, the founders were familiar with the great works of medieval Christian philosophers, such as St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas. However, the majority of the founders were Protestants, and they chose to rely on the writings of Protestant reformers, such as Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, and Samuel Rutherford. Some of whom had developed rather robust theories regarding the bounds of legitimate government. John Adams went as far to say that without Protestant reformers, our nation would not have even been founded. The founders were also steeped in legal writings which developed both natural law and common law doctrines, written by esteemed men such as Sir Edward Cook and William Blackstone. In Hamilton's now famous letter, the farmer refuted, Hamilton thought that it was astonishing that anyone in their enlightened age would know so little of the law of nature and the natural rights of mankind. And Hamilton admonished the recipient of his letter to study these natural law experts, such as Grotius, Kupendorf, Locke, and Montesquieu. He explained that the law of nature originated from God that mankind's natural rights proceed from this, and that civil liberty is founded upon these rights, and upon these natural rights rested the American cause. In addition to philosophy, Christian political theory, common law, and natural law, the founders were familiar with the great empires throughout history. They had personal experience with the failures of the monarchy and an all-supreme parliament. They understood that absolute power in the hands of a few eventually produced tyranny. The form of government that made them the most hopeful was a republic. Yet they knew that republics were not immune from failure. It was a form of government that required active vigilance and knowledgeable participation by its citizens, thus making it harder to sustain. Our founders were learned men, and they did not pull their ideas out of thin air. And certainly, federalism was well known and debated, though they relied heavily on honesty as a guiding light on that subject. Yet, what is often overlooked is what exactly informed their understanding and ultimately guided them to choose the constitutional framework in which they did. I do not believe that we can really understand the political philosophy of our founders and the role of federalism without getting a glimpse into their worldview. But what is a worldview? Well, it is a comprehensive framework of assumptions that each of us holds about the world we live in, about mankind's relationship to the world, our relationship to each other, in our relationship to God or not to God, as the case may be. A worldview, as author David Nagel puts it, will attempt to find the answers to the why, whence, and whither questions of life. The founders shared a common worldview, which we will refer to as the traditional Christian worldview. Now, how many were actually Christians is another topic, and one that is not necessary to explore to come to this conclusion. A person can be a deist and still have a Christian world, worldview. But the overarching point is that this worldview guided their understanding about government. So let's cover just a few bases of their worldview. First, they understood that mankind originated from a benevolent creator who gave man free will, natural rights, the law of nature, and the ability to govern himself. The Declaration of Independence is very clear on this. After the fall, the nature of man was sinful, resulting in enmity with his fellow man and rebellion against God's moral order, for which he would face judgment. Yet man was also capable of virtue. The Federalist Papers expounded on both of these points, as well as the personal writings of the founders. Consider these words from the Declaration signed by John Hart. He said, it is appointed for all to die, and after that the judgment. Or 
consider the dying words of Alexander Hamilton. I have a tender reliance on the mercy of the Almighty through the merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a sinner. I look to him for mercy. Indeed, they understood that God judged nations in the course of history and thus appealed in the declaration to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of their cause. Thomas Jefferson, believed to be one of our more secular founders, illuminates this common belief in God's judgment on the nations. He said, God who gave us life gave us liberty. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God? They are not to be violated, but with his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. Lastly, their worldview addressed the solutions to man's plight which was God's forgiveness and a hope for a future reward. With regard to civil society, to receive God's blessing instead of judgment, the founders believed that mankind needed to abide within God's moral order. President George Washington, in his farewell address, stated, of all of the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Morality is a necessary spring of popular government. These foundational presuppositions about the why, whence, and whither questions of life led the founders to understand man in his place in the world. Like the great philosophers before them, they began with the most elemental aspect of society, the nature of man before attempting to build the framework of American government. In their Christian worldview, they understood human nature as flawed. As stated in Federalist Paper 51, but what is government itself? But the greatest of all reflections upon human nature. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. Thus they limited and divided power to reduce the possibility that the sinful tendencies of men would become tyrannical and magnified through the levers of government. As Madison stated in Federalist Paper 51, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Hamilton put it this way, power being almost always the rival of power, the general government will at all times stand ready to check the usurpations of the state governments. And these will have the same disposition towards the general government. If the people's rights are invaded by either, they can be, make use of the other as an instrument of redress. On a more positive note, they believed in the redemption of man and his ability to grow in virtue. The principle of federalism also answered this in practical terms. It provided the means by which the wisdom of people serving locally to provide strong self-government. Local control is how most people refer to it today. In essence, it is the principle that civil matters ought to be handled at the least centralized level of competent authority. The proponents of our Constitution recognized that historically republics were small. Montesquieu suggested the concept of a confederate republic. That is, small republics working together in a unified, larger republic. And the founders embraced this idea and built upon the great principle of representation. Nonetheless, the founders constantly pointed out what even the least religious among them knew. As Benjamin Franklin stated, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. John Adams, our second president, in the military address states, we have no government armed with the power of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Now, our founders probably did not envision a day 
when we betrayed our religious heritage for European skepticism or full-blown secularism. American culture, as Alexis de Tocqueville noted, was one where the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom were united intimately one with another. He saw that all denominations in the United States were within the great Christian unity and wrote that the morality of Christianity is everywhere the same. He credited this, credited this for regulating the morality of the entire nation. So this was the so American society that our founders understood. And within this context, the writers of the Federalist Paper were so confident in the system of federalism to protect the liberties of the people that they did not even consider a Bill of Rights necessary when drafting the Constitution. They expected the national government to focus on external objects as war, peace, negotiation, foreign commerce, and for the states to deal with everything else concerning the lives, liberties, and properties of the people and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. Hamilton even believed the idea of the Bill of Rights was necessary and dangerous. For he wrote, why declare that things shall be done for which there is no power to do? In their view, the national government would be so limited in its constitutional authority that it should pose no risk to sovereign state functions. But if it did invade individual liberties, they expected the states to protect their citizens. Hamilton wrote that the state governments will, in all possible contingencies, afford complete security against the invasions of public liberty by the national authority, meaning both militarily and legislatively. Of course, today we are experiencing something quite different. Before we consider what's what went wrong, Let's, however, look at what went right. Because our founders accomplished something truly remarkable in the history of mankind. Under our Constitution, America became known as a beacon of hope for the world. Our forefathers proved that societies of men are really capable of establishing good government from reflection and choice rather than on accident and force. They did not get everything right. With all of their combined brilliance, they could not give us a nation without slavery, even though most of them knew that slavery was against the very natural law which they sought to uphold and upon which they claimed the right for American independence. Compromising on that foundational cornerstone of natural law led to dire consequences for the individuals caught in that system as well as for the entire nation. However, even with this deep and tragic flaw in the fabric of our country, America still became the foremost symbol of freedom into the world and the land of opportunity for wave upon wave of immigrants to this land. Unlike other nations around the world, we don't have problems keeping people in. We have problems keeping people out. In less than 200 years, America became the most powerful nation in the history of the world. These principles of limited government have allowed human potential to soar and free enterprise to flourish. Prosperity and freedom have, been, have become synonymous with America. However, things are changing. In the index of economic freedom, the United States is no longer at the top. In fact, we're no longer in the top 10. As of this year, we are now the 12th freest economy in the world. Due to deteriorations in property rights, fiscal freedom, business freedom, and increased government spending, taxation, and regulation. According to the study, the United States is the only country to have reported a loss in economic freedom in each of the last seven years. Well, what's gone wrong? That's an important question. Oh. A lot. As citizens, we, we need to identify what's going on. And we need to determine how to set things right. We've known for quite some time that America is well past the point when the, the powers of the national government are few and defined. 
We are now beginning to see firsthand how the growth of centralized power causes liberty retreat. To retreat. Years ago, the Anti-Federalists warned the proponents of the Constitution about some of the weaknesses in their design. Those warnings can help us discover why federalism has eroded. So let's examine four of their concerns. And the first, which needs no further explanation. They warned that the unlimited borrowing power of the national government would create a national debt so large as to exceed the ability of the country to ever repay. What else can you say? Secondly, although the Federalists approved the United States Senators being elected by state legislators, they were concerned that there would be no term limits and no provision for recall if these Senators fell under the spell of the Federal City. They failed to consider that one day state legislators would relinquish their constitutional duty to elect Senators. In the constitutional design, states were to maintain exclusive and very important portions of sovereign power. By exercising direct representation in the Senate, they would be constituent parts of the national sovereignty. The advantage, according to the Federalist Papers, was that legislation needed first the concurrence of, the, of a majority of the people through the House of Representatives, and then a majority of the states through the Senate. Such direct representation of the states in the National Assembly is a classic example of federalism. However, with the passage of the 17th Amendment, United States Senators are no longer held directly accountable to state legislatures, and thus there is a weakened respect for state sovereignty. The Anti-Federalists also predicted that the lawmaking and judicial authority of the national government would require legal submission by the states, and eventually the exercise of such power would subvert the state authority, thus gutting federalism. Today, the erosion of state powers by Congress and the setting aside of state laws and state constitutional amendments by the federal courts has become epidemic. For the record, the Federalist Papers assure the American public that the federal government would be no impediment to reforms of the state constitutions by a majority of the, of the people in a legal and peaceful mode. This right would remain undiminished. But today, very few judges, very few federal, ju federal judges take this seriously, and thus they regularly trample upon the rights of the states. The Anti-Federalists also suggested that the national taxing power would grow to the point that states will find it impossible to raise money to support their governments, and thus their powers would be absorbed into that of the federal government. Madison, however, argued in the Federalist Papers that Congress's power to tax and spend was limited to the enumerated powers of Article I, Section 8, powers such as regulating commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with Indian tribes coining money and regulating its value, establishing post offices and roads, ensuring the progress of science and arts through patents and copyrights, establishing more federal courts, declaring war and maintaining the nation's army and navy. These were the objects of national responsibility. Yet as we see today, the anti-federalists were right again. Congress has not stayed within those bounds. And with the Supreme Court's approval, it has set up vast bureaucracies, bureaucracies, creates all manner of programs, and constantly allocates money to functions solely meant for state authority. Education is a prime example. Let me just elaborate on this point for a minute. In 2009, Congress spent $90 billion in kindergarten and 12th kindergarten grade education. With this comes increased regulations. At last count, there were 10,800 of them. According to economics professor Courtney Collins, this re represents the replacement of state and local control with federal education mandates. Though the st states are still able to raise revenue, such massive amounts of federal money 
for the state and local governments to the trough to beg for earmarks, grants, and other support in, order, in, in exchange for doing the will of Washington bureaucrats. This, in turn, is weakening our state legislatures because they no longer focus on being the faithful guardians of the rights of their citizens. Making the situation worse, we purposely hand over the people's delegated power to state executive officials who further collude with federal officials for even more money for programs which circumvent the will of the people. This is how we ended up with race to the top and its mandates common core. In my effort to repeal the common core in the state of Georgia, we sought to take back part of that uh, legislative power which the previous legislature had given to the executive branch. Our bill language required the executive branch to give notice to the General Assembly about any grant sought, to provide an analysis of unfunded mandates, to provide long-term cost of the program, to report any potential transfer of governments to parties outside of the state, to identify policy redirection and any negative effects on the constitutional rights of our citizens. This language failed to make it through the process because of the objections of the executive branch. However, this is the type of legislation which is needed to regain the people's sovereign authority and to make the executive branch accountable to them. Our founders firmly rejected the idea of an all central, powerful government forcing is uniformity upon the people. A theory advanced by Thomas Hobbes and referred to, referred to as Leviathan. However, as federalism arose, we see more and more what our lives would be like under Leviathan. I just mentioned how national education reforms are circumventing the consent of the government. As, as a result, under Race to the Top, Central planners now require intrusive data collection on our children and require local school boards to implement national standards developed by elitist and unaccountable nonprofit corporations. Ever since the early 1990s, the stated goal of federally driven education reform is to create a seamless web from cradle to grave that merges education with labor planning. According to Nobel Prize, when he recipient Friedrich Hyatt to walk the road to serpent, such central planning, such central economic planning is the prime instrument of socialist reform. His book explains how centrally directed economic activity allows reformers to coerce all society towards their purposes and to so-called social justice. Take, for example, the Affordable Care Act. We are now required to purchase health insurance. As a result of this socialist reform, many of us have lost our doctors, and most of us pay more for health insurance. Businesses and religious institutions are coerced into offering health services, which conflict with their religious convictions. Government, rather than respecting religious diversity, is seeking to impose religious conformity through the Affordable Care Act. On another front, federal courts are overruling voters in our states, telling them that their views on marriage no longer matter. And now they must allow same-sex marriage. Leviathan is attempting to control, to control not only economic life, but our social life, and even define the parameters of our religious beliefs about something as sacred as marriage. Without the most robust federalism, we see that even the foundational principle of Republican government, the consent of the government, is being lost and it's getting worse. When our president governs by executive order, he is really saying that he is ruling by arbitrary power. His will, instead of the will of the people, as expressed through Congress. But America was not established for arbitrary rule. Our founders expected the people to be sovereign and for the legislative branch to predominate as taught by Locke and recognized in the Federalist Papers. Why? 
because the legislative branch is the only branch of government that represents the will of the people. And it is the branch that has the delegated authority for lawmaking. Through the legislature comes the consent of the government. We need to stop repeating the phrase that we have three co-equal branches of government. legislative branch to be supreme, and the judicial branch to be the weakest, with the executive branch being somewhere in the middle, but with all branches having sufficient power so that no branch would be able to exceed its constitutional limits without being checked by another. We have a daunting task ahead of us. Before this election, I would have said that we were lurching toward the life in the next 10 years. Now I have a little pull. But even so, I'm afraid that America has lost her way. However, that way can be regained. But this requires a decision by the American people. We must decide how shall we live? Will it be under the blessings of liberty? And if so, what alternative is there to federalism to safeguard that liberty? And can we completely disregard natural law? as a, the philosophical foundation for federalism? Natural law provided the original foundation of federalism to work properly. It is highly improbable that we can remove this original foundation from our political system and replace it with the competing foundation and still, still expect a self-governing nation of free people to survive. If we allow the socialist progressives to erase this foundation, federalism will either collapse into a centralized, all-powerful state, or we will have a counterfeit federalism that will be used for purposes contrary to natural law, thus allowing states and local governments themselves to become tyrannical. In both cases, government will not recognize or protect our natural rights. Despite this gradual erosion of liberty which we're witnessing today, I'm confident that the promise of liberty has not been completely removed from the hearts of the American people. But in order to cause it to flourish again, there are some things that we must do. First, we must become passionate advocates of federalism and make this part of the conscience of the grassroots. I have five children, two boys and three little girls. My wife and I meet with them regularly and talk about life issues. I'm with the boys and she's with the girls. My sons and I are learning something about what it means to be a real man. That means we reject passivity. We assume responsibility and we lead courageously. I have every confidence that every person in this room possesses those qualities and you're capable of that. And that is your passion. You cannot be passive. You must assume the responsibility of advancing the principles of liberty and freedom and federalism throughout your state, throughout this land. And we must lead courageously while doing that. Along those lines, we must elect leaders who are committed to advancing federalism and who will appoint judges who will respect that principle in their decisions. We must work for a balanced federal budget, whether through constitutional amendment or otherwise, as well as set limits on tax and extending powers of the national government. State officials, state officials must reject federal and private programs that undermine the authority of the people of the state. When that big wooden horse rolls up to the gates of your state, you better look at it very carefully because there are some ugly things inside. We should consider giving state legislators the power to recall United States senators when they disregard <laughs> Congress must reduce the discretion that it has given to executive branch officials, departments, and commissions 
We've given them the power to write laws. That's the job of Congress. It's the job of the legislature. And finally, and I believe that this is critical, we must focus on the next generation to ensure that they receive the right understanding of American history. And have